Ready? Yeah. Is it going? I'm going? It is? Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, welcome back. Today, we're going to do a really important topic um, in interviewing and um, just algorithmic stuff, um, which is called big O notation. And so there's a mathematical definition for big O notation. And it talks about upper bounds, and sometimes it confuses people. But there's a root concept that you need to understand when you think about um, calculating algorithmic time complexity. So we ask ourselves a really key question. We ask ourselves, how does an algorithm's speed scale when it input becomes very large? And very large is the key term here, because for an ex example here, we have a function that runs in n squared and a function that runs in linear time O of n. So as we can see, the O of n is actually, um, actually O of n squared is faster at the start um, versus O of n, but what you see is as input becomes very large, um, the O of n squared algorithm has a much longer runtime than the linear time. So this is why it's called asymptotic complexity. It's looking at tail behavior. It's looking at the literal behavior of a graph as input scales very large, and that's a very important question when you're thinking about algorithms and optimization. So no matter how far O of n goes, it's going to be bounded by O of n squared, and bounded is a very key term. So what O of n, what, what big O gives us is a very tight upper bound to functions. We know that this, this linear function is not going to go past an n squared function as input becomes very large. We know that the linear time function is going to be faster as inputs very large. So here's a very big, here's a very big mistake that's made with runtimes. O of n linear time is a very common runtime, but what is n? What it, is n string, the string length? Is it the amount of tree nodes? Is it the size of the array? Like what is n? And a really key thing that an uh, interviewee needs to do is define what is n? What are your variables? What are you scaling? What is your input? This is very important. Um, so let's take an example. If you have in two strings of input, our runtime is not O of n. This is a very common mis or, or mistake. It, it would be O of m, and, and then you have to factor in n. You, so n would be the first string's length, and m would be the second string's length. And it might be m plus n, it might be m times n. It depends what the problem is. So what if we're only using the larger string? Then we get into min and max notation where we say O of max, m, and n. So we, if we're just taking the larger string, we don't know whether we're taking m, we don't know whether we're taking n, but we know we're taking the larger one. We know we're taking the max of them. So we can use this notation here to say this is what we're basically doing. That's a shorthand. So moving on, we're going to look at the common time complexities um, that you'll see in different kinds of problems. So the first time complexity is constant time. So what does constant mean? Constant time means that as an algorithm gets very, very large input, the, the runtime of the algorithm stays the same. It could be O of 26, it could be O of 2 to the 32, as long as it's constant. As long as it's a constant line, that means it's constant time. It doesn't matter how large that constant is. What we're worried about when we think of big O, we're worried about tail behavior, the form of a graph, the way something scales. And what constant time looks like is as input gets bigger, that line stays level. The runtime of the algorithm does not change. So then we get to log n time. This is something that really confused me a lot um, because I wasn't good at lo logarithms when I took calculus. And we call this logarithmic time. So normally it's base two, but we're, we, we care about the behavior. Again, this is the number one thing I have to stress. Logarithmic behavior looks like a, log a, looks like a logarithm. And it grows kind of like this. So the question that a logarithm asks us fundamentally log base two asks us is what power do I need to power my base, in this case it's two, by to get n. What do I need to power two by to get the original n? So take for example log 16. How do we get 16 from two? What do we need to power two by to get 16? We need to do two to the fourth. Two to the fourth is 16. So what, is that, what does that mean? That means it takes us four steps of having 16 to get to one. And as you can see here, we take 16, get 8, 4, 2, 1. We see that we're having. So this is a really key thing, me saying having. What, like, what, what, well, where does that factor into? So this is a very key thing. So where that, where that factors into in, in your algorithms are your binary search. 
What binary search does, it has the invariant that something is sorted. Invariant just means something that's always true within our certain space of, of searching or doing or performing work. Is the invariant that we can have the search space and keep it sorted. So this is where logarithm, logarithms come into play. We're having our search space. And if we have a binary tree, or a binary search tree that's balanced, every time we go down a level, we're cutting off a whole half subtree. We're literally having our search space every single time. And this is only if the tree is balanced. I'll get into doing tree videos um, later. But it's O of N if the tree is unbalanced. If it's skewed to the right or left, then it's going to, you're going to be touching all of the nodes. Um, so, but that's just another detail for another day. And then O of N time is the most common. O of N time is um, linear time. So whether you have n tree nodes, whether you have a string length n, an array length n, um, this is when you're going to see a linear time algorithm because you're going to be touching all n of the nodes. And e even if you're doing multiple passes over an array, you're going to be doing 2 to the 2 n, 3 n. But what, you, what, what we care about is not the, we don't care about the constants. This is why we drop the constants in big O notation. Three, big O 3 n is the same thing as big O n because we care about the behavior. The only thing a constant is going to do is going to make that line steeper. That's all we care about. We care about the behavior. And then we get into, this is one of the more confusing complexities as well. This confused me a lot, n log n. So what is this saying? It could be saying a lot of things. Um, it could be saying we're doing log n work for each of the n elements we have. This is what multiplication does. I'll talk about multiplication addition in another video. So what does it mean? So often we see this time complexity with quick sort and merge sort, our faster sorting algorithms. So here's an example to run through everything. So say n is 8. Say we have 8 elements. And log 8 with base 2 is 3. 2 to the 3 is 8, right? So this is basically how merge sort works. It's going to take our unsorted input. It's going to have it each time. And what we notice here is we have three levels of work. And where is this 3 looks familiar. We literally, we just got this three up here. That, that is not a coincidence. So we have three levels of work, and why is it three? It's because we, we take the log of the eight because we're doing halving steps. Just like I was saying before, the idea that we're cutting things in half is important. This is where it plays in. So we are cutting things in half, and we're going to have log n levels. And for each of those log n levels, which in this case are three levels because log eight is three, for each of those three levels, we're going to be doing constant work. We're going to be touching all n elements in each level to be merging these on the way up. I'll get into like specifics of merge sort and quick sort in another video and how the recursion builds back up. But this is very fundamental. This is an easy, good way to understand this complexity because we have log n levels and we're doing constant work in each level. So this is kind of like what you should be visualizing. So next we have n squared. Anytime you see n squared, it's always going to be probably the first naive solution to a problem. And it's going to be our more naive sorting algorithms. Things like bubble sort, um, selection sort, insertion sort. So one thing, that, um, one thing that you'll notice is even if you have a normal array, so something like this with one, two, three, four, if we do three comparisons for this index, two comparisons, one comparison, zero comparison, it forms what looks like a triangle. And what this triangle is cut out of is a square. So what is the square from? We have n by n. That's n squared, and we're taking one half of it. So even if we're doing something like this, and we're taking one half n squared, what do we notice? We notice there's a constant right there. And what do we do with constants? We drop constants because the behavior stays n squared. So things like triangular numbers and things like that, those end up being n squared anyway, although they end up making a triangle of sorts with their sums. So that's another thing to look out for. Um, and then we have uh, 2 to the n, it could be 4 to the n, it could be, it could be 6 to the n. Um, we have exponential time. So exponential time, we normally see that when we have backtracking problems, um, recursive problems that are creating forks. And for each of those forks, we are creating, we're creating two forks and we're going to have n levels deep. We'll, we'll look at that when we look at the Fibonacci over there. But um, problems like this are like subsets. Um, and different like backtracking recursive problems we'll get into. And then finally we have factorial time. So this is called n factorial and you'll see this time complexity when calculating things like permutations. So here's, here's a really good example. Do you think you could? Can you see it? You can see it? Cool. 
Okay, so we have cat. So what we need to do is we have three elements to place. Once we place the first letter of each, we have two leftover elements, and now we need to place two elements in, th we fork three times. So let me not get into too much into specifics. What you really need to see here, do you see how there's three forks here? Do you see how there's two forks here? So what you need to notice is that for each of these three levels, we're gonna be forking twice. For each of these tw twice forked levels, we're going to be forking once. So what does this look like? It looks like three. It looks like three times two times one. What is three times two times one? That's three factorial. So this is why we get the n factorial time here for the permutation problem. Um, and the reason, and also it, it's actually n, um, n, n times n factorial because if we do constant amount of work to copy the string over in each of these n factorial calls, that's like, it depends what, how much work you're doing in each call, but there's going to be n factorial permutations and n factorial calls. Uh, which follows this pattern right here. So whenever we're optimizing solutions like this, normally a pattern you'll see is you can lower the time complexity and up the space complexity. You can store more space and store more meta information about your problem and then you can lower how fast your algorithm runs because you know more about the array you're working on or something else. And then you also can increase the time complexity um, but also lower the space. So you do more work um, and do, do things and take longer, but you keep less auxiliary space. So which one is better? Which one makes more sense? So sort of the answer is we, we, we can buy memory, but we can't buy time. So in a production setting, in most settings, it would make more sense because we, we always can buy more servers. We can buy more um, instances of, of, of computing power, but you can't buy time. So what you'll find most often is the best trade-off is to increase the space and lower the time because you want things to run fast. So moving on, we have space complexity. And this is where some people get confused. Space complexity is exactly the same thing as time complexity. The only thing that changes is the question we're asking. So here, the question we ask is, how does the space usage of our algorithm change as input becomes very large? So it's the same thing. There's no confusion. We still have constant time. We still have linear space. We still have log n space. We have all of these same complexities, just our question changes. So. The biggest question to ask is what space does your program create? Do you create a single array of n elements? Then you have linear space. Do you create um, log n elements? Um, do, you, it, do you create n squared? Do you have an n by n matrix that you're copying over instead of doing a, something in place? Those are the questions asked. What auxiliary space does your algorithm use? Or is it in place? Does it just use constant space? Um, and then also the runtime stack counts as um, part of our space complexity. So here's an example of the runtime stack counting. So the, there's, there's a famous thing called the Fibonacci sequence and it's defined recursively as the nth element is the, the one element behind that nth ele element plus two elements behind that nth element. And then the base cases are the zeroth element is worth zero and the first element is one. So this is what the recursion tree looks like. If I want to know Fib4, I ask myself Fib3, Fib2. If I want to know this, I ask myself 2, 1. If I want to know 2, I ask myself 1 and 0. So what do we notice? How deep does the call stack go? Because this is sort of like backtracking. We'll go deep, and once we solve this problem, the call stack is going to remove these. It's going to remove this. It's going to remove that. And at max, how many calls do we have on the stack? At max, we have we can see we have four levels. We're going to have four levels on the stack. And four looks familiar. Where do we see four? We see four as the input. Our input n is four. So what does our space complexity become? We see that our space complexity becomes O of n. It becomes linear. Because at max, we're going to have n calls on the call stack for this, um, for this recursion. So if, if, if sometimes interviewers will not count um, stack space, that's something you should just explicitly ask. Should I include that in the space complexity, um, the amount of um, space that recursion takes up on the call stack? So that's something to keep in mind as well. So this is a very huge point. Um, the number one thing is what we'll do when, when, when I first learned big O notation, I would try to memorize 
um, the shape of code. I'd see two for loops and I'd say n squared. I'd see one for loop, I'd say n. But that's not what you should do. Don't try to memorize the shape of code. Don't try to, don't try to guess anything. You need to actually know what's going on because first off, if you know what's going on, it's going to hit you to the solution. If you know something, best case is log n, then you know that it's going to be something like binary search or something where you're having the search space. So also, secondly, you can't guess in an interview. An interviewer will ask you, what is the best case? What is the worst case? And what is the average case of this? You can't guess in an interview. So don't actually learn the complexities. Try to understand and like be flexible when you're answering a problem. Like think about it on your own before you try to read someone else's response about what a complexity is. So here's kind of examples. So if an interviewer tells you, this is going to use log n, and the array is sorted instantly, you should think binary search. If an array is sorted and there's, they want it to run in log n complexity, there's literally, well, I, I'm not totally sure, but there's, there's basically no other thing it could be but something that cuts the search space in half. You're cutting work in half. So something binary of sorts, often binary search. And if they tell you that, if you, if you say that I have no idea how to do this problem, it's going to be exponential in time, they tell you, yes, it's going to be four to the end, best case. What do you instantly know? You know that the most optimal solution is going to be something like backtracking, recursion, complete search, something where you're exhausting many possibilities and making many forks at each layer of, of the call, for each call, doing many forks. So this is basically everything um, to do with Big O, and Big O is a very important interview topic. Um, one really good thing to do is when you get an interview question is to instantly state the time and space complexities. Not only is it impressive, it, it, it shows your interview that you, interviewer that you know what you're talking about and you think about the solution before you actually uh, solve it. So basically that is Big O time and space. I think that's a good uh, gist of it. So, yeah.